Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that Jesus rules, that he is supreme, and that you have set him upon a throne, and that we can call him our Lord and Savior. Father, we, we want to be under his leadership, under thy leadership. We want to serve thee. So please help us this day to understand better uh, your plan for having order in your people and your church. And give us your Holy Spirit. I especially want to thank you that uh, you helped Brother Amat Singer do so well in his surgery and that he's making a good recovery now. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to just quickly mention this. Um, I asked you to pray for Brother Amat Singer's surgery uh, a couple of days ago that uh, his surgery went well. The first uh, day, at, day after the surgery or the day of the surgery, um, he was in a good bit of pain, discomfort, wasn't feeling well, probably due to a lot of the uh, anesthesia and things he'd been through. But I was able to visit him personally yesterday and he was looking very good. He was able to speak and eat well and he's up walking around, even going up and down the steps. And they're hoping that he'll be discharged from the um, hospital uh, tomorrow. So. That's, that's really good. We're looking forward to that. Today we're uh, discussing, and I didn't know if we we're going to record today or not, but uh, we're ready to record the meeting if you were going to record the meeting. Today we're discussing uh, an aspect of gospel order concerning avoiding two extremes. The extreme uh, of having a hierarchy where one or just a few people rule everything uh, against the, the opposite concept of having anarchy, where there really is no governance, no uh, order, no kind of system of keeping things together. The Bible says, as we noted before in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 33, that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now, it's interesting that this word that we translate to confusion, God is not the author of confusion. It is a Greek word, katatasia, uh, and it's also used in Luke chapter 21 and verse 9, in Luke 21 verse 9, where Jesus said, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. And the Greek word that we translate to commotions is the same word that we translate confusions here in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And again, that word is a akatastasia. And what it means is confusion or upheaval. Uh, it has been said in this particular lexicon, the uh, Lonida, that it means to rise up in open defiance of authority with the presumed intention to overthrow it or to act in complete opposition to its demands. It is possible that a katatasia in Luke 21, 9 denotes merely unsettled conditions, but it is far more likely to carry the meaning of, of insurrections and revolts. And so Jesus says here that you hear of wars and insurrections and revolts. These are things that we expect to see as time goes on. Now, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion or of insurrections and revolts. He is not the author of defiance to authority, and especially his own authority. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, he says that we are to let all things be done decently and in order. And so that means that there is order in heaven, in fact. There is a statement that Ellen White has made in the testimonies in volume six, page 200, in paragraph two. And she says there simply that order is heaven's first law. Order is heaven's first law. There's a, a statement also in volume four of the testimonies on page 429. And there it says, in heaven there is perfect order, perfect obedience, perfect peace, and harmony. Those who have had no respect for order 
or discipline in this life would have no respect for the order which is observed in heaven. They can never be admitted into heaven, for all worthy of an entrance there will love order and respect discipline. Now, that's an interesting idea. There is a will of God and an order in heaven. And we are informed here that if we have no respect for order and discipline in this life, we would have no respect for the order and discipline of heaven. And without this, we cannot be admitted. And I think that this should help us to see more clearly this issue and the necessity of having some kind of gospel order. Not only is God's will, including order done in heaven, it's Christ's desire that it be done here on earth. Because when Jesus gave the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so just as things are in heaven, he wants them to be here on earth, his will to be done. But his will in heaven is perfect order, perfect obedience, perfect peace, perfect harmony. And so God wants that. In the first chapter of Ezekiel, the prophet claims in, in Ezekiel 1.1 that he saw visions of God. Yet, as we read Ezekiel's vision, we learn of living creatures, and we interestingly learn of wills within wills. In Ezekiel 1, verses 15 through 17, he says, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one will upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. They went, excuse me, when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Here Ezekiel seems to be describing what we would call um, planetary gears or inner gears that are, are working within each other and they are interacting with living creatures. This is strange language. You know, what could it mean? Well, Ellen White gives us a comment on it in Letters and Manuscripts 13, uh, Manuscript 13 of 1898 in paragraph 9. She says, God is acquainted with every man. Could our eyes be opened, we would see that eternal justice is at work in our world. A powerful influence, not under man's control, is working. Man may fancy that he is directing matters, but there is a higher than human influence at work. The servants of God know that he is working to counteract Satan's plans. So just remember this, friends. Satan has plans. Satan has order. He has organization in his work. Don't forget that. She continues, those who know not God cannot comprehend his movements. There is at work a will within a will. Apparently, the complication of machinery is so intricate that man can see only a complete entanglement. But the divine hand, as seen by the prophet Ezekiel, is placed upon the wheels, and every part moves in complete harmony, each doing its specified work, yet with individual freedom of action. So what Ezekiel saw represented God's divine hand moving the wheels in a harmony, each wheel having its perfect freedom to do its individual action. And God's order is to be in perfect harmony in the work that he has chosen for the believers. Not all have the same duties. Not all have the same responsibilities, but we are all to perfectly work and perform the work that God has chosen for us to do with complete freedom. For example, God has ordained that there are going to be pastors in his church in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible speaks about that, but not everybody is designed to be a pastor. Other members have different duties um, within the church, but each believer fully meshes fully and in total harmony with the work that God has directed from above, and they work uh, with each other in harmony, just like those gears or wheels within wheels. Heaven is a place we noted of harmony. Noted, for example, in early writings on page 16 and paragraph 2, Ellen White describes, as we all entered the cloud together, 
and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads. He gave us harps of gold and palms of victory. Here on the sea of glass, the 144,000 stood in a perfect square. In other words, they just weren't placed in any particular way. There was an order about them. And she mentions later in early writings on page 287 and paragraph seven, I'm sorry, 287 in paragraph two. On each side of the college chariot were wings, and beneath it were living wheels. And as the chariot rolled upward, the wheels cried holy, and the wings, as they moved, cried holy, and the routine of holy angels round the crowd, cloud cried holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the saints in the cloud cried glory, hallelujah. And the chariot rolled upward to the holy city. Before entering the city, the saints were arranged in a perfect square with Jesus in the midst. So here again, we, we see order. And God wants order in the earth as well. Since the creation, God has ordained order upon the earth in a way that, that has changed slightly since sin came into being. God ordained originally that Adam and Eve were to stand shoulder to shoulder as equals. In Testimonies, volume 3, page 484, in paragraph 1, it says, when God created Eve, he created that she should possess neither inferiority nor superiority to the man, but that in all things she should be his equal. The holy pair were to have no interest independent of each other, and yet each had an individuality to think and act. But after sin, God allowed man to lead out in the home. In Genesis 3, verse 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, this expression, rule over thee, does certainly not mean, does certainly not mean to be a dictator or Lord, because we have one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ. Men have one Lord, that is Jesus Christ. And women have one Lord, who is Jesus Christ. In, um, I'm sorry, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul notes how the order of heaven relates to the order of humanity. And here he says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. During the time of the wilderness wandering of the Israelites, God had order. He chose Moses to be a leader, and then under the counsel of Jethro, God allowed for others to govern under Moses. In Exodus 18, verses 25 and 26, it says that Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So when it says that they were rulers, it really means that they were like judges. They helped to decide cases. In Numbers chapter 2, we learn of the order, the encampment of Israel. Uh, in, 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 in camping, a lot of times, you, you can go to a wilderness area and camp out and you just put your tent, your belongings, wherever you want to. But you couldn't do that in Israel. You couldn't just put your tent anywhere you wanted to. All the tribes had a specific place to encamp around the Levites and the priests who camp in specific places around the tabernacle. And here, if you can see the slides, are just two graphic models of how those arrangements were uh, to be made. And there wasn't to be any deviation from God's word and order in the slightest on this matter. God gave specific directions for how the worship would be done in Canaan. And through Moses, God instructed Israel concerning even the eating of sacrifices. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. He said, And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand into, ye in your households, wherein the Lord thy God bless thee. Ye shall not do after all the things 
that we do here this day, even every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Now, another translation that says this, do not worship the way that you have been doing today, each person doing what he thinks is right. You have not yet come to a resting place to the land the Lord your God will give you as your own. In other words, it was not to be every man could decide for himself how to do it. We would think, well, yes, gospel freedom should allow us to make our own decisions. Yes, in a sense, that's true, but they need to be the right decisions. And they need to be decisions that are based upon God's word and what God has told us. I want to tell you, friends, God is not for anarchy. He is not for this idea that every man can just do whatever he wants. God had a plan for Israel in every facet of the lives of the people, and he has a plan for modern Israel today. In the Old Testament, Israel quickly lost their connection of God, and shortly after the time of Samuel, we read these words. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, in, in one person's eyes, um, homosexuality might be good. In another person's eyes, bestiality might be good. In someone else's eyes, all disorder in the church might be just good. They might just think that's what we should have. But you see, what we think usually is wrong. Almost always what we think is wrong. <laughs> what we need is what God says and what God wants. And that's the only thing that's really important. Now, while the context of this statement is different than that in Deuteronomy, the principle is the same. Forsaking God's way for our own way. Later in the uh, last verse in Judges, we read this in Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, God obviously did not want Israel to have a king, but he made provision for them to have a king. But he wanted to have judges to help to, quote, rule or judge over the people. He didn't want power centralized in just one person, but neither did he want anarchy everywhere. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2, he says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. In Psalms, we realize that the Psalms have been constructed, uh, constructed, thank you. The Psalms have been constructed and in a parallel manner. God says one thing, and then sometimes he'll say the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Uh, a synthetic parallelism is sometimes called. But here, this is, this is a parallel of, of an uh, antithesis. This is a parallel of opposites. The first part of it says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But then it contrasts. It doesn't compare, but instead it contrasts that now. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. And so this idea that what every man does that's right in his own eyes is not what God wants. It's, it's the very opposite of what God wants. The last judge to govern Israel was Samuel. And through his wisdom and guidance, uh, even though they were above reproach, the wicked sons of Samuel were of a very different character. And this caused the people to fear for the future, and it brought about the request that they had in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and verse 5. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And that was a real problem, friends, because they should never have wanted to be like the rest of the nations, and neither should we as a church desire to be like the rest of the churches. But God allowed the kingdom of Israel to be formed, and though it was not his sovereign will, respect was to be shown to this new order. Even when David was being unjustly hunted down and persecuted by Saul, David showed respect to the one upon whom the throne the throne was given by twice refusing to kill the persecuting Saul when it was easily within his power uh, to do so. In the New Testament, we find order, just like there was order in the Old Testament. There's order now in the New Testament. Jesus declared that he would build a church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, after the great confession of Peter, Jesus said, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. The church that Jesus would build would have order and administration. And the Apostle Paul notes five spiritual gifts given to the church to especially help it to reach perfection and to maintain spiritual order. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 14, he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And he did this for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so, friends, if, if we neglect these gifts that God has given us, then we're not going to be able to reach perfection. And we are going to be as children tossed to and fro, and we will be coming along and accepting every wind of doctrine that's just going and all that they, that they, um, they teach. So we don't want that to happen to us. Um, pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, prophets, they're not in the church because men decided that they should be there, but rather because Jesus has decided that they should be there. A little while back, I received a letter. Uh, and, and in this letter, this sister noted, she said that she was against having pastors and any leaders because Jesus is the head and he himself will lead the church. Well, that might sound good, but that is actually a katatasia. That is a katatasia. That is an actual rebellion against the Lord himself. Because the Lord is the one who said that there would be pastors in his church. And if I say, well, I don't accept the idea of pastors. I don't want pastors. I want Jesus to be my pastor. I want Jesus to be the head. That is actually in rebellion against what Jesus himself has set up and put in his church. It is actually an open defiance of, against the authority of Christ. And yes, of course, Jesus is the master shepherd. He is the master pastor. But remember, the principle that heaven does not usually do for man what man can do for himself. In, um, again, a katatasia, it means to rise up in open defiance against the authority. But in Signs of the Times on September 4, 1879, paragraph 11, God never does what man can do. And so God could he could take a more direct um, role in governing the church, but he has committed this role to men because men can do it. And so he has done that. And uh, God, he does want to use men and leadership positions, and people can work better together than they can apart. And this principle is revealed in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 26, verses 7 8. He says, And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Now notice the numbers. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Now that's an interesting idea, because if you look at these numbers, and I used to teach mathematics. I was a mathematics teacher at one time in my life when I was younger. And if you look at the ratios mentioned, he says five would put 100 to flight, yet 100 would bring 10,000 to flight. With five working together, that's the same ratio of, of five to 100 or one in 20. One person puts 20 to flight. But if you take uh, 100 to 10,000, that's a reduced ratio of one to 100. What it means is that as more were working together, the efficiency increased five times. The efficiency increased fivefold. Now, of course, as we mentioned the other day, Jesus made also provision for deacons and elders in his church. There are some offices and titles of men that are not in the New Testament, which should never be recognized by believers today. There are people who claim to be popes and cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops. They claim to be his holiness, his eminence. They claim to be reverent, very reverent, and most right reverent, and they even call themselves Father. But because a false gospel order has entered into some of the professed churches does not mean 
that we should not recognize the order that God has put in his church. Just because some churches have a hierarchical system of ruling doesn't mean that there should not be some type of gospel order. God has actually prepared the church to have governance by representation. During the uh, circumvent during the crisis of the early church, the, the people gathered together with representatives of the church and council. And uh, we find here in uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, some of the background behind this. It says, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Concerning this, we are told in the book Acts of the Apostles by Ellen White on page 190 in paragraph 2. In the church at Antioch, the consideration of the question of circumcision resulted in much discussion and contention. Finally, the members of the church fearing that a division among them would be the outcome of continued discussion, decided to send Paul and Barnabas with some responsible men from the church to Jerusalem to lay the matter before the apostles and elders. They were to meet delegates from the different churches and those who had come to Jerusalem to attend the approaching festivals. Meanwhile, all controversy was to cease until a final decision should be given in general council. This decision was then to be universally accepted by the different churches throughout the country. And so God's idea was to have these people come together with representatives from different churches. It would be virtually impossible to have all the members to meet together in one place, but they could elect and, and, and choose representatives to go to the general council of Jerusalem and where all these people would come together and they would make a decision. Now, the New Testament is the model for God's people today. If we want to have a blueprint for how we should run our church today, we should look at the book of Acts. It is his blueprint for how we should work today. You know, if, if I have a hand, a hand, a hand is great with the body, but you cut it away and it becomes worthless by itself. A foot is great with the body, but you cut it away and it's worthless without the body. For a human body to function at its best, it needs all of its various parts working together. And the same is true concerning the body of Christ. He does not want us to be independent atoms. God certainly does not wish for the body to be broken up into many factions or independent atoms. And repeatedly, we are warned in the spirit of prophecy about this. The remnant people have been given instruction. This is from the Spalding and McGann collection on page 121 and, and uh, paragraph one. And it's a long paragraph, so I've broken it into three pieces so that you could see the slides a little better. But she says, an army in battle, she gives us an illustration first, an army in battle would become confused and weakened unless all worked in concert. If the soldiers should act out their own impulsive ideas without reference to each other's positions and work, they would be a collection of independent atoms. They cannot do the work of an organized body. So the soldiers of Christ must act in harmony. They must not, they alone must not be cherished. If they do this, the Lord's people in the place of being in perfect harmony of one mind, one purpose, and consecrated to one grand object will find efforts fruitless, their time and capabilities wasted. Union is strength. A few converted souls acting in harmony acting for one great purpose under one head will achieve victories at every encounter. And that's from Spalding McGann collection. Um, yes, okay. I guess I had it in two parts. I thought it was in three parts, but it was just in two parts. Um, also in a uh, pamphlet that Ellen White had written and was published in uh, from Sunnyside Cornbong on June 8, 1889, pamphlet 156, on page 12, in paragraph one, she says, my brethren, the Lord has called upon you to do a certain work, but you have not done it. And now in the place where you are, there is discord and contention and strife, but this need not be. God does not design 
that his workmen shall step apart as independent atoms. All have a great and solemn work to do, and it is to be done under God's supervision. So apparently, when she says that they had a work to do, but it wasn't done, it wasn't done because too many people were trying to work as independent atoms. They weren't working together as a united body. And then in eight letters and manuscripts, um, letter 16 of 1893 on paragraph 20. Again, I say, the Lord has not spoken by any messenger who calls the only true, the only church in the world that keeps the commandments of God, Babylon. True, there is chaff with the wheat. But first gather the chaff and bind it into bundles to burn it and gather the wheat into the gardener. I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There's not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Those who have heard this, mess, this false message and tried to leaven others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions and they will come to naught. Now, I've included some extra in this testimony. The main part is the middle part. I know the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. But she also defines what that church is. It is the church of the people who keep the commandments of God. It cannot be people who are worshiping false gods. That cannot be the church that Ellen White is speaking of here. Not at all. And she speaks here um, how that the plans of Satan um, they will be to try to disorganize us, if you, if you please. But she says that this is not what we are to do. In Gospel Workers, on page uh, 487, and paragraph 1, she says here, Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among his people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly and that there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise, careful labor. And she's speaking about the labor of people like Elder White, Jane Andrews, uh, Uriah Smith, Joseph Bates and others. She says, license must not be given to disorderly elements that desire to control the work at this time. Excuse me, please. These statements, they should lay to rest all the doubt the, uh, that the idea that we can please God and finish the work in, in, with just independent ministries and just home churches that bear no accountability or responsibility to anyone else. We are not to work as independent atoms. The, the brethren in the United States should not work as even, even that great collective group as independent atoms, separate, exa for example, from the brethren in Africa or Kenya or Australia or wherever. In Acts of the Apostles on page, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I thought I had Acts of the Apostles here next. Give me just a second, see where I'm at. I may have. Uh, yeah, I went too far. Okay, here we go. Again, in Gospel Workers, and then we'll go to Acts of the Apostles next. In Gospel Workers 487.2, continuing from the paragraph we just read, some advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, and we're there now, right? We are at the close of time. Everyone agreed? Yes, amen? We're at the close of time? Okay. So some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work, there's no such thing as every man's being independent. The stars of heaven are all under law, each influencing the other to do the will of God, yielding their common obedience to the law that controls their action. And in order that the Lord's work may advance healthfully and solidly, his people must draw together. You know, you think about the stars and you have these, uh, these solar systems and then these galaxies. And if you've ever seen a picture or an artist's conception of what they believe the Milky Way galaxy looks like, you have this spiral um, plane of all these different stars working together 
And as like, for instance, the gravitational effect of one pulls and, and relates to the others. And it, they, they work in a harmony together, the one helping the other to keep in place. And God wants his people to be like that. If we're working in properly harmony under the right laws and right influences, then we will help keep each other in balance and, and in place. This is really, really important. Um, in Acts of the Apostles, on page 164 and paragraph one, she says, the Lord in his wisdom has arranged that by means of the close relationship that should be maintained by all believers, Christian should be united to Christian and church to church. Thus, the human instrumentality will be enabled to cooperate with the divine. Every agency will be subordinate to the Holy Spirit and all the believers will be united in an organized and well-directed effort to give to the world the glad tidings of the grace of God. Uh, friends, this should put, put to rest any idea that we can just all work as independent ministries, again, as independent churches. He wants us to be united Christian to Christian and church to church. Your church, my church, all the churches that we're in, involved in, they should be united together. Uh, not just simply the individuals, but the churches as well. God organized the church in the New Testament, and he wants to organize us today. Finally, with the three angels' messages began to be, to be given, he organized the Advent people after the pattern of the New Testament. Order, instruction was, order and structure was given to the people, which we today should not, and maybe I should say dare not even, uh, neglect. Excuse me. Um, in series B, number nine, page 19 and paragraph two. This is written in 1907. Notice what she says. Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly that there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise, careful labor. License must not be given to disorderly elements that desire to control the work at this time. Under the direction of the Spirit of God, workers such as Elder White, Joseph Bates, Elder Smith, carefully build up the work and is not, allowed, is not to be allowed to become disorderly and to have these kind of um, revolting elements in it. This does not mean that we are to have a pope over the church or even a president over a conference. Men are not to rule over other men. In Testimonies, Volume 8, on page 236 in paragraph 3, it says, God has not set any kingly power in the Seventh-day Adventist church to control the whole body or to control any branch of the work. He has not provided that the burden of leadership shall rest upon a few men. Responsibilities are distributed among a large number of competent men. Indeed, she says, every member of the church has a voice in choosing officers of the church. Every church chooses officers of the state conferences. Delegates chosen by the state conferences choose the officers of the union conferences, and delegates chosen by the union conferences choose the officers of the general conference. By this arrangement, every conference, every institution, every church, and every individual, either directly or through representation, has a voice in the election of the men who bear the chief responsibilities in the general conference. Now, that was the system that they had in Ellen White's dime. And we are certainly not advanced enough to have that much organization at this time. But as the local churches begin to organize, and then the local churches within areas begin to organize, this is what it could come to, and this is the ultimate solution that God has uh, for us. So this would bring out about a system where as the church becomes large and each person represents, representing himself or herself becomes very impractical. You can't do that. You just can't have everybody coming together. Even at the general conference sessions that the church, the Adventist church has been having in the last several years, they have several thousand people come together and it's still quite a, a job to keep order there. Can you imagine if you had 200,000 people or a million people or 20 million people come together, it'd be very difficult to have order. But this brings about an important point that needs to be clarified. Have we not been counseled by the Spirit of God that there's to be no new organization? Before we can answer that, 
let us notice how firm the foundation was that God laid the Advent movement upon. Through his messenger, Ellen G. White, God has told us that after the passing of the time, God entrusted to his faithful followers the precious principles of truth. And she wrote this. This is found in Selected Messages, book two, uh, page 389, paragraph three. But she wrote this in 1905, 1905. She says that God gave his people principles, even precious principles of present truth. God did not raise up this movement in error, as Trinitarian Advents claim. You know, the Trinitarian Advents, they say that God raised up the movement in error, that he taught them not to eat swine's flesh relatively early, but he waited 50 years to teach them who he was. Well, friends, that just doesn't, doesn't make a sense, and it doesn't uh, agree with the divine history. Furthermore, it is these very principles that make us who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. Continuing in Selected Messages, she says, those who passed through these experiences are to be as firm as a rock to the principles that have made us Seventh-day Adventists. And so, friends, to leave these principles would certainly disqualify us from being the very people these principles made. Seventh-day Adventists, and that's what we should be, true Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White saw this point, and she gave clear warning. She said, the Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. Every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. From these statements, we can see that God has entrusted to the seven day Adventist people precious truths, precious principles of present truth. These principles make us seventh day Adventists. We find here that to step off the foundation of these principles is to apostatize from the truth. And it results in a new organization, a new church, if you please, and it forfeits us from being Seventh-day Adventists. When the, when the professed church steps off the foundation which God has established, discarding the principles instead of strengthening them, they have formed a new organization. Now, this point was admitted by the former General Conference President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Neil C. Wilson. He, is the, he was the father of the current General Conference President, um, and uh, he gave a speech at the Annual Council in Washington, D.C. in October of 17, I'm sorry, October of 1979, and he was quoted in the Adventist Review. And here's what he said. He said, our doctrines cannot be changed without changing the nature of the church. He says, let the word go out from this annual council that any attempt to tear down the pillars of the faith will be resisted. But that's exactly what they did the next year in Dallas, Texas at the 1980 General Conference session. They destroyed the main pillars of our faith. Now, a little thought will help us see that the difference between any two or more churches is simply the doctrines that they teach. What makes Baptists Baptists? What makes Baptists Baptists are their doctrines. What makes Catholics Catholics is their doctrines, whether it's Sunday sacredness, the Trinity, the immortal soul, whatever it is. Those are the teachings that make them what they are. It is the teachings that make some of the events what they are. Those that practice the precious principles of truth that God gave to his people. When Adventists, who formerly believed and practiced those precious principles of present truth, when they backed away and discarded those principles for other principles, they left being Seventh-day Adventists, even though they claimed to use the name, even though they trademarked the name and copyrighted and tried to sue anyone and put people in jail who tried to use it. But now consider those who believe and practice the precious principles of present truth. Perhaps they've been disfellowshipped from those who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists, but have left the platform of truth. Are these faithful ones who have been disfellowshipped, are they really not truly the true Seventh-day Adventists? 
and they surely are. And if those people simply reorganize the movement, friends, that is not starting a new movement. That is not going against the counsels of the spirit of prophecy. When we try to organize ourselves, people will tell you, you know, you shouldn't do this because Ellen White said you're not to have any new organization. But we are not creating a new organization. We are simply trying to reorganize the work that God has given to us originally. These apostates are the ones who have created a new organization. But because they keep the same name, it looks just like to many people who have no discernment or are not studying and don't understand anything beyond the surface of the, of the matter, it looks like the same thing. But let's look at just a few of the fundamental points of the movement, going back to when we first published our fundamental beliefs in 1872 and 1889. Concerning God, we said that there is one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, an eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable, and everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit, Psalms 139 and verse 7. I think every one of us would say amen to that. We believe that. We believe that is true. We believe the second point, that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom God created all things and by whom they do consist, and that he took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham. But that statement, those statements are very much in contrast to the current statement of fundamental beliefs. And this is the statement as it was published after 1980 in the fundamentals. And it's essentially the same statement that is published today. It says that there is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. And entitle this the Trinity. And then they say God is immortal, all-powerful, and so on. But notice that he is said to be the Trinity. And he is a unity of three co-eternal persons. Friends, this is language from the Catholic councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. This is the, the exact wording that is used in the Constitution of the World Council of Churches and the basis for membership in the World Council of Churches, that you believe in the one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the unity of three co-eternal persons. But how does, does the church uh, interpret this? I maybe, let me just see here. I'm sorry, give me just a second here. Okay, going on. I'm sorry. Here it is. It says, God is omnipotent, transcending all space, yet he is fully present in every part of space. He is eternal, exceeding the limits of time, yet is fully present in every moment of time. They say that the Son is God eternal. God the, God the eternal Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ, forever truly God. The Holy Spirit is God the eternal Spirit, and that was active with the Father and Son in creation. I think that there are some very clearly different uh, principles at work here, and they're very apparent. The first two principles of the 1889 statement tells us that there's one true God who is the Father, and that he has an eternal Son, Jesus Christ. The 1980s statements of belief tell us that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in harmony with the Catholic Athanasian Creed. The 1889 principle tells us that God is a personal being, singular. The 1980 and the current statement belief says God is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a plurality of persons. The 1889 fundamental principles tells us that God is present everywhere by the Holy Spirit. In 1980 and the current belief, number two, says that God himself is omnipresent and that he transcends all space and is fully present in every part of space. The 1889 principle, number two, states that Jesus is the Son of the Eternal Father. The new statement says that he is God, the Eternal Son, forever truly God. The 1889 fundamental principles do not mention the Holy Spirit as in describing the Godhead at all. In 1980, in the current statement, it says that the Holy Spirit is God, the Eternal Spirit. Now, as Neil Wilson noted, and it truly should be self-evident, if you change the doctrines, you change the nature of the church, especially doctrines that describe the God you profess to worship. The beloved God was not taken by surprise. Through the prophet, he alerted the remnant the people of what to expect. Writing uh, in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 204, and this comes out of actually Series B originally, but she says, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition 
that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this principle, to, were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant people would be discarded. Have we seen that? Absolutely. Continuous. Our religion would be changed. Was it changed? Of course it was changed. Because you change the doctrines, you change the nature of the church. The religion has changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Go to one of the organized Seventh-day Adventist churches today, the mainline church, and tell them the Trinity doctrine is a false pagan doctrine, and just see how well you are received. You are, you, this is accounted as error. And then she says, a new organization would be established. Here's the new organization. Not what we're trying to accomplish, friends, but what they have already done. She goes on to say, books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. A system, excuse me, a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do what they call a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempests would sweep away the structure. It says God is removed. God is removed. God himself didn't remove himself. They removed God. That is how terrible the apostasy is. Friends, Satan did try to bring in a false reformation, and it would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. And this is the process that has resulted in a new organization. Ellen White, she speaks about the, these different characteristics here, and that our truth would be accounted as error. She does not say that God leads his people because of these issues, but instead states that God, again, has been removed. And the only part of this prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet is that storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. But friends, it's going to. It just hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen soon. This inspired statement tells us that if we step off the foundation of the principles given us in the beginning, that we apostatize from truth and enter into a new organization. We have shown earlier that the corporate Seventh-day Adventist Church has apostatized from its fundamental principles concerning God. Thus, it is a different church, a new organization, than that which existed in 1889, and in fact, during all the lifetime of Ellen White. This is further emphasized by the following statement by former Andrews University professor George Knight. I'm sure some of you have heard of George Knight. You may have seen this particular issue of the Ministry Magazine and the lead article entitled Adventist and Change, the Dynamic Nature of Present Truth. Well, Present truth is dynamic, but friends, present truth doesn't change because change is eternal. I'm sorry, truth is eternal. The truth doesn't change. And in this article, George Knight wrote, he said, most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. He says, more specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. Now let's just think about the principle of separation from the Bible for just a minute as we close. The following references outline a guiding principle which can apply in this case. The first is found in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. There he says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And the implied answer is no, you really can't. This is why we can't work with the Baptists, why we can't work with the Catholics, why we can't work with the Methodists. Because, friends, we're not walking in agreement. And I want to tell you, it's also why we cannot, we cannot work with the mainline corporate Seventh-day Adventist church. I'll try to use those words carefully. Because there is a true Seventh-day Adventist church. And you and people like myself, we are the true Seventh-day Adventists. And we are reorganizing the work today. But we cannot organize and work with people who deny Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. We cannot work with and cooperate and have a, a union with people who deny the final atonement in heaven today and that Jesus is now making atonement for us. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. He says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The principle of separation also is mentioned in the testimonies. And if I go back in my personal life, 43 years, I was coming into a spiritual awakening in my life really for the first true time. And I had a copy of the book, Great Controversy. And when I read this statement, it did something to change me. This statement did something to change me. I remember where I was at when I was reading this specific statement for the first time. And I remember the effect it had upon me. I hope it has an effect upon you. It says, after a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. So they would try to hold on if they could, if this church would free itself from falsehood and idolatry. But may I remind you concerning the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, the, the prophet told us that nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. They are not going to free themselves from falsehood and idolatry. It's not going to happen. It goes on to say, they saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. I, I just don't know how anyone could say it more clearly than that. And then continuing in Great Controversy on page 46 in paragraph one. Well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, these are not of vital importance. This degeneracy is strengthening the hands of the agents of Satan so that false theories and fatal delusions which in the faith, which the faithful in ages past imperiled their lives to resist and expose are now regarded with favor by thousands who claim to be followers of Christ. And then in the Desire of Ages, on page 232 in paragraph two, and I've broken it into two slides here. It says, as the light and life of men was rejected by the ecclesiastical authorities in the days of Christ, so it has been rejected in every succeeding generation. Again and again, the history of Christ's withdrawal from Judea has been repeated. When the reformers preached the word of God, they had no thought of separating themselves from the established church, but the religious leaders would not tolerate the light, and those that bore it were forced to seek another class who were longing for the truth. In our day, few of the professed followers of the reformers are actuated by their spirit. Few are listening for the voice of God and ready to accept truth in whatever guise it may be presented. Often those who follow in the steps of the reformers are forced to turn away from the churches they love in order to declare the plain teaching of the word of God. And many times those who are seeking for light are by the same teaching obliged to leave the church of their fathers that they may render obedience. Now that part that I put in bold there, they are obliged to leave the church of their fathers. I don't know if you have thought about what that means. I'm sure some of you, maybe all of you have read it at one time or another. But what does the word obliged mean? They were obliged to leave. Well, obliged is defined as to make someone legally or morally bound to an action or course of action. For instance, doctors are obliged by law to keep patients alive while there's a chance of recovery. So there's a moral aspect to this. When she says that they were obliged, that means they were under a moral obligation to leave those churches because of their apostasy. 
And uh, this reference that we just quoted in Desire of Ages declares the biblical principle of separation must be followed by the faithful if we are going to be faithful to Christ. To remain in an apostate church, according to Revelation 18.4, would result in finally becoming a partaker of her sin. So God calls for us to organize on right principles. Um, Ellen White, in 1901, called for reform among the church. And in fact, she had called for reform prior to this as well. And there were refor reformations, reformatory measures made in the way the General Conference worked in 1897 and then in 1901. And she stood on the platform of the General Conference and with the leaders of the General Conference behind her, she said these words, that these men should stand in a sacred place to be as the voice of God to the people, as we once believed the General Conference to be, that is past. What we want now is a reorganization. We want to build at the foundation and to build up a different, upon a different principle. This was in 1901. And specifically, she had stated um, in 1896, and, and I don't have this in my slides, but in series, um, special testimony series A, number eight, on page 28, paragraph four, she says, it is not wise to choose one man as president of the General Conference. In, um, in 1901, just before this General Conference began, there was, she had a meeting in the college library at Battle Creek. And she says, and this is found in Spotting McGann Collection 166.3. She says, now the Lord wants his spirit to come in. He wants the Holy Ghost King. She made it plain that we were not to have a kingly power in our church. We're not to have anarchy for sure but neither do we have a kingly power. And in fact, if you read the history, if you read the bulletins of 1897, the General Conference bulletins of 1901, 1903, you're going to learn a lot of history about how the church went through changes in its constitutional structure of organization. And in 1903, the General Conference responded to the calls of Ellen White for reorganization, and they actually abolished the office of president of the General Conference. But then in 1903, they brought back the Office of General Conference, and Ellen White went to Elmshaven after that, and she wrote a testimony that she found in volume eight of the testimony, starting around page 247, I believe, and it's entitled, Shall We Be Found Wanting? Shall We Be Found Wanting? And she speaks about the, the faithful city becoming a harlot, and she realized that we were heading back to, a, or heading in a direction that wasn't a good direction, that we had, had uh, we, we built upon organization, and God had helped us, but it wasn't perfect yet. And they were trying to make it better. They were trying to resolve certain issues. And one of those issues was a kingly power in the church. And she says, we shouldn't have this. We don't want a general conference president. In 1901, they actually voted to have a general conference committee of 25 members. The original idea was to have a rotating chairman, but finally A.G. Daniels was elected as the permanent chairman of the, of the committee, but they weren't to have a president. But then in 1903, they voted back in the presidency, and we, we, it, it just everything started going downhill after that. There were people who stood up against the new constitution, people like A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagoner, uh, Dr. Paulson, Dr. McGann. They all spoke against this new constitution having a presidency. They explained very clearly what it would do. And this is a, a whole other study I don't have time to go into today, and I probably should stop at that. But I, I would encourage you to study the history of those general conferences and what happened. And you'll see a lot of things that explain why things are going like they are today. So we will take time to have prayer now, and then we will open up the floor for questions. I'm sorry I went a little longer today than we did, but we got started just a little late, so that makes up a little bit of time. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you want to have uh, order and organization among your people here on this earth, and that order is the first law of heaven, and that thy will is to be done in earth as it is in heaven where there is order. So help us, Father, not to be in revolt against you and your ways, to, to not try to go by our own ways, but to go by your way, and to go as a united people. Please give us understanding and uh, uh, your spirit as we discuss perhaps any questions or other thoughts brothers or sisters have. 
And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.